The Gloriana Set by Thebe Moon, read by Ella Max Mabella. Chapter 16 The Way of the Wingweed. Hermione's sleep that night was plagued with unpleasant dreams, less powerful than the nightmares she'd suffered right after war, but disturbing nonetheless. She kept dreaming of danger, herself running from more danger, images of her parents in danger, her friends in danger. Then, a particularly vivid scene of Malfoy in danger, no specific danger, just a feeling, and calling her name. This last dream finally woke her, and she found herself sweating and gasping in the dark. She was in a vile mood at breakfast, and Malfoy's absence in the Great Hall strangely didn't make her feel any better. She was poking at her food, letting Ron and Ginny's Quidditch talk wash over her, when suddenly the voices around her stopped. Hermione looked up to see McGonagall standing beside her. Miss Granger, if you will accompany me, please, she said and turned away without waiting for an answer. Hermione exchanged a baffled look with Ginny and stood up, shouldering her back and trotting after the headmistress. McGonagall moved quickly for her age. Hermione was panting once they reached the top of the stairs on the third floor. She stopped and stared. A thin black mist blocked the side corridor leading to ancient ruins. A figure emerged pale against the mist and her eyes narrowed. Malfoy. Thank you for coming, headmistress. It's this way, he said. What is it? Hermione asked. Did you conjure this mist? Don't be afraid, Malfoy said. I'm not, she snapped. McGonagall stepped through the mist without hesitation, and Hermione followed. The headmistress had stopped on the other side, and Hermione stepped around her to see better. Then she also stopped and stared at the opposite wall. The wide stretch of stone at the end of the corridor now covered in blood-red letters. Die, mudbloods. Not again, she breathed. Explain, Mr. Malfoy, McGonagall's voice was called. Oh, I can't. Malfoy moved past them, stepping closer to the letters, then turned. His face was composed, but one hand clutched the strap of his leather bag tightly. It was here when I arrived at the classroom. Indeed, Mr. Malfoy, he frowned. As soon as I saw the letters, I blocked the passageway and sent a student to find you. McGonagall didn't answer, merely handed Hermione a piece of parchment. Headmistress, please come to the ancient room's classroom immediately. Bring Granger. Draco and Malfoy. Hermione bit her lip. Malfoy's actions, if believed, demonstrated surprisingly good judgment. McGonagall stepped forward to inspect the letters more closely, and Malfoy edged closer to Hermione. She gave him a warning look, but he just rolled his eyes, pulling his hand out of his rope pocket. He held a small potions vial, half full with red liquid. But from the message, Hermione stared at him. Damn, another good move. Malfoy stepped closer, pressing the vial into her hand, his fingers lightly brushing her palm, before moving away again. She clutched the vial tightly. Miss Granger? McGonagall turned back to face them, and Hermione hastily tucked the vial away. Would you be so kind to ask Professor Bluebell to join me here? There will, of course, be no ancient runes class this morning. You may consider this a free period. Yes, headmistress, Hermione said. Mr. Malfoy, you will remain with me, please. McGonagall sat, looking back at the letters again. Hermione turned and walked through the mist without a backward glance. It would be daft of him to write that message, then immediately inform the headmistress and Hogwarts post to go in mudblood. The ferret will be fine without me. Malfoy reappeared at lunch, and Hermione tamped down her relief. The castle was buzzing with news of the second message, and Dennis Creevy was especially venomous about Malfoy's guilt. There is absolutely no proof that Malfoy wrote those messages, Hermione said calmly as she sorted her chips. The hate in Dennis's eyes almost made her quail. The Death Eaters wants to carry on Voldemort's work, he asked. He wants to kill all of us muggerbones. Enough, Dennis, Ginny said sharply. Malfoy isn't trying to kill anybody. Now there's a switch, Ron said. Dennis barked a laugh, but Ginny, Hermione, never all frowned at Ron. What? Ron asked. Don't tell me you've forgotten the sixth year. You know when he tried to kill Dumbledore? You knew he'd kill me, too. He didn't, though, Hermione said. He hasn't killed anyone. That we know of, Ron said darkly. Dennis nodded. You saw what went on on Malfoy Manor, Hermione. Merlin, you were. You're prejudiced, Ronald, Hermione cut in. 
she was not going to talk about Malfoy Manor. You don't like Malfoy, so you're spot on there, Ron said, slamming down his goblet. He's more than just a get, he's dangerous, and you talk to him like he's some kind of wounded bird. It makes me sick watching you and Ginny smile at older Slytherins. Exactly, Hermione cried. You're prejudiced. You refuse to see that anyone has changed. Well, we've all changed. Malfoy, Theo, Ginny, never all of us. She stood and grabbed her back. Everyone but you. When the hell are you going to grow up? She slammed her way out of the great hall and into the entrance hall. The sound of footsteps echoed behind her, and she halted, rubbing the ridges on her left arm, wondering what else the day had in store for her. Sort off, Malfoy, I'm a no- I'm not Draco, I'm happy to say, said Theo's voice. Hermione turned around. I'm happy too. You rather let us all down over there at the Slytherin table. We were all hoping you'd tell Weasley to fuck himself. I lost ten galleons. She eyed Theo carefully. Do you think Malfoy wrote those messages? It would violate his probation, wouldn't it? He'd never be that stupid. Exactly, Hermione said. I... The great hall doors burst open and students streamed into the entrance hall. Let's go, Theo said, taking her hand. You have a bology in the greenhouses next, right? She nodded. Theo had care of magical creatures, so she let him lead her up the short staircase to exit the castle. A tingling instinct made Hermione turn back, and there was Malfoy entering the entrance hall, walking in an empty ring as students flowed warily around him. He halted, and he could clearly see her and Theo, she knew, standing above the crowd, their hands clasped, and she could see Malfoy's upturned face, his clear eyes holding hers, giving nothing away, the afternoon sun on his hair. Hermione swallowed and turned away, trying to ignore the twisting feeling in her chest. She held Theo's hand more tightly, fingers curled around her smooth, broad palm, refusing to remember another rougher palm on her throat and the words, I know you think of me. Herbology had become one of Hermione's favorite classes for two very good reasons. One, Professor Sprout was adamant about hand raising during his citations, and two, she said nowhere near Draco Malfoy. But this educational idyll was shattered that afternoon with Professor Sprout's announcement of an advanced seminar in Herbology. McGonagall and the Ministry had given Sprout permission this year to allow select students to cultivate a rare but volatile plant. What is a plant, Professor? Blaze asked, but Sprout very properly ignored him and nodded towards Hermione's raised hand. Thank you, Professor, Hermione said, savoring a small moment of justice in an anything but just world. What is the plant? I cannot reveal the plant's name right now, Sprout said. But we'll be growing three specimens in the small greenhouse on the west side. Everyone looked to the right-hand glass wall to see a small structure outside, its windows painted over in a rainbow of colors. Only six students are qualified to study this plant, she went on, unrolling a piece of parchment. I received the last parent wave about this morning, so we can move forward. She looked up from the parchment. Any of your six can, of course, decline the new assignment and remain with the rest of the class. This assignment is for extra credit, and you'll be expected to write essays on the plans studied in our regular classes as well. Hermione's paws jumped. Parent waver. This plan must be really dangerous. She was so busy reviewing all the dangerous plans she knew, from nightshades to devil snares, that she nearly missed Sprout reading aloud the name. Ranger. Hermione expected no less. Greengrass, also expected, in addition to her beauty and Quidditch skills, Astoria Greengrass was known for her talent in herbology. Her family, Hermione knew, had planted the famous Greengrass Gardens, the most lavish botanical preserves in the wizarding world. Hermione had never seen the gardens, they could be viewed by invitation only, and such invitations were never extended to muggerborns or half-bloods. Longbottom, she said. No surprise there, he'd been helping Sprout prepare for the lessons. Malfoy? A ripple ran through the class, and there were scattered hisses. Of course. He'd been so quiet in this class, bearing Luna's chatter with remarkable fortitude, that Hermione had dared to hope that he wouldn't qualify for this special group. No such luck. The Slytherin hadn't so much as looked at her in classes all day. Sprout rounded out the group with two seventh-year Slytherin boys, 
then addressed the rest of the class. Please review the chapter on the venomous tentacular until I return. She led the chosen six out of the main greenhouses and into the smaller structure. There was little to see, really. No plants, just a large cupboard and three long wooden tables with stools. A weak sun shone through the greenhouse's only clear window above. Take your seat, please, Sprout said briskly. I've divided you into pairs, alphabetically by last name. Granger and Greengrass, Longbottom and Malfoy, Stern and Wheelwright. Hermione glanced at Neville with concern, but her friend just shrugged and joined Malfoy at a table. Hermione found herself directly facing Malfoy, but at least she didn't have to work with him. She was so thankful to avoid Malfoy, in fact, it didn't even hit her that she was paired with Astoria until the young woman took her seat, eyeing Hermione with regal disdain. Malfoy has a very specific type, Janice's voice echoed in her thoughts. Slutty, gorgeous, rich, pure-blood, bitch. Hermione couldn't help but wonder how far things had gone between Malfoy and the tall beauty opposite her. Astoria's hair, a rich golden colour, drew back from an arrow straight centre part to shining braids that wound around her head. Diamonds glittered in her ears and peeped above the collar of her uniform shirt. Hermione didn't know Astoria very well. She was just Daphne Greengrass's little sister, and Daphne was vain, idle, not worth noticing. This Greengrass, however, could not be ignored. Ginny considered Astoria a formidable opponent in Quidditch, and Hermione had seen her performance in Herbology, the only class they shared. I wonder what she was like last year, Hermione thought. And then you follow the Caras, Astoria, Crucio, innocent students. Do you miss those days, a school free of mudbloods, with plenty of frightened children to terrorize? Such questions filled her mind as she held Astoria's tilted blue eyes, now slightly wary. Your money and blood mean nothing to me, Hermione told the other woman silently. Go ahead, start something. I'm waiting. Didn't know how long the staring contest would have lasted, but one of the glass panes behind Professor Sprout snapped loudly and the entire class jumped. Hermione tore her gaze from Astorias to see a large, multi-branched crack in the pink-painted glass. Dear me, Sprout said, flustered. She repaired the glass with a flick of her wand. Hermione bit her lips, silently cursing her lack of control, her eyes meeting Malfoy's briefly. His brow was creased slightly as he watched her and Astoria. A parchment and quill appeared on the table before Hermione, and she was grateful to have something else to look at. Parents of all students under eighteen have signed a waiver, but the three eighteen-year-olds here must sign their own waivers releasing the Ministry of Magic from any liability, Sprout said. Hermione scanned the document quickly. Typical boilerplate promising not to sue the Ministry if she was injured or disfigured in any way. She also would sign away all rights for her family to sue on her behalf if she suffered a fatal incident. What kind of plant was this? She shrugged inwardly and picked up the quill. She and her friends had cheated death every year they attended this school. She highly doubted a plant would finish her off now. The three signed documents flew into Professor Sprout's hand, and there was a short silence while everyone waited for something to happen. All the waivers include a confidentiality clause. Sprout said. The parchment has been magically treated, so if any student shares information about this plant with others or smuggles class material out of this greenhouse, there will be uncomfortable consequences. Neville turned slightly to grin at Hermione, who smiled back, thinking of Marietta Escombe and Dumbledore's army. Malfoy looked at the two of them with narrowed eyes. We will be studying a semi-sentient plant, Sprout went on. Can anyone tell me what that is? Hermione and Neville raised their hands in the same instant, so she didn't mind that Sprout selected her friend. Semi-sentient plants can perceive or feel things, Neville said breathlessly. Some, like the parrot pot, can even communicate. Yes, ten points to Gryffindor, Sprout said smiling. While the parrot pot is fairly harmless, often only repeating the words spoken to it, the plant we will be studying is rather more aggressive. She waved her wand and a single parchment appeared on each table. It was a drawing of a flowering plant in a pot. Its branches cut like vines, curving over the pot and reaching outwards. The blossom's petals were broad and also curled, with sharp thorns clearly visible. Sprout waved her wand again, and two thin books appeared on each table. Imani picked hers up. It was titled, 
in the way of the winkweed. She looked up in surprise. She'd never heard of that plant. The faintest of lines appeared on Astoria's brow. Winkweed is an extremely rare plant, Sprout began in a lecturing tone, and there was a small rustle as the students rushed to take notes. Its proper name is Wota Winchen, and it is also known as the Hoodwing Plant, Astoria said. And now please, Miss Greengrass, Sprout said, but yes, you are correct. It is also known as the Hoodwing Plant. Is there anything else you would like to tell us, Miss Greengrass? It is very dangerous, Astoria said frostily, and illegal to cultivate. Yes, Sprout said. While the plant remains extremely rare, it is beginning to spread beyond the dark, cool, isolated environments in favors. Therefore, the Ministry is allowing a select number of herbologists and students to study it. Fortunately, winkweed is a fragile plant and difficult to pollinate, but it is aggressive, if not vicious, if threatened. Your assignment today is to read the first chapter of The Way of the Winkweed and label the drawing before you. The class will have no homework. All reading and studying will be accomplished in class. You may proceed. Sprout turned and left the room, and every student immediately opened his or her book. Hermione was disappointed that they wouldn't get a glimpse of the plant today, but perhaps that was best. She immediately dove into the text. Winkweed was discovered in 1567 by a fur trapper in the Caucasus Mountains, and... Hermione looked up suddenly. Greengrass, what are you doing? she hissed. Her partner had picked up her quill and was about to mark the drawing. The assignment, Granger, Astoria gave her a mocking smile. Professor assigns, students complete. Surely you are familiar with the concept? Vaguely, thank you, Hermione smiled back. Not the instructions are to read the chapter, then mark the drawing. Note the conjunctive adverb then in that sentence. Surely you are familiar with that concept. Astoria waved a dismissive hand. Unnecessary. This is obviously the stem, for example. Nothing is obvious about this plant, Hermione said. I never heard of a winkweed and you obviously know next to nothing. Making assumptions sound like a quick way to end up in St. Mungo's. And I thought Gryffindors had courage. And I thought Slytherins had an ounce of self-preservation. The two women glared at each other until Astoria set down her quill and picked up her book. Hermione read through the first chapter, pleased to be reading more quickly than Astoria. The other woman had been right about the stem, of course, but that wasn't the point. Hermione had hoped to read the second chapter while waiting for her partner, but the rest of the book was empty, no doubt enchanted to reveal its chapters one at a time. Astoria closed her book and looked down her nose at Granger. Even sitting, Hermione was a few inches shorter. I assume we may mark the drawing now, unless the brightest witch of our age has an objection. Her voice dripped with acid. None at all, Hermione said brightly. You may label the stem if you like. It seems like a fairly conventional plant in terms of structure. Yes, that was readily apparent to the discerning eye, Astoria said, marking other parts of the drawing with quick efficiency. The two women worked in silence, caught in subtle competition to provide the most labors. Perhaps the seminar won't be so bad, Hermione thought, as long as they didn't talk. Neville and Malfoy had also discovered the virtues of silent partnership. They had finished their drawing without exchanging more than a few words. Sprout re-entered the greenhouse. Mr. Malfoy, she said, the headmistress would like to see you in her office. Malfoy looked surprised, but immediately packed up his things and left. Hermione frowned after him, wondering. I know what you're doing, Astoria said. Hermione turned back to the way of the winkweed. It's called reading, you should try it. I heard you defending him at lunch. Be assured he will never be so desperate. Astoria sat with the curl of her perfectly painted mouth. His family may be in disgrace, Granger, but they will never sink so low. Hermione sniffed. If you're speaking of the Malfoys, I don't think it's possible for them to sink any lower. You think you can redeem him? Still an ancient wizarding title. You! Hermione stared at the other woman in amazement. Astoria thought she wanted to be a Malfoy. Live in a Malfoy manner where she was tortured. With Lucius Malfoy for a father-in-law. 
She couldn't help shaking her head and grinning a little. Good God, Drake. I thought you Slytherins were supposed to know people. You honestly think I'd aspire to anything so cursed and empty? Sentence myself to such a cold and miserable life? Astoria smirked. I've seen him look at you. Wouldn't it really be so cold? Hermione spent every spare minute in the library over the next week trying to develop a potion that could identify a blood sample. It was a first vital step to finding the person who wrote the message since McGonagall's interviews with students and staff had revealed nothing and only appeared to strengthen the case against Malfoy. The Wizarding's world's attitude towards blood was shockingly medieval, Hermione concluded, almost worshipful. Few witches and wizards cared to look beyond its fearsome power and see blood as a substance. A substance that could be identified. It took days just to pinpoint the differences between magical blood, muggle blood, and animal blood. She'd never have succeeded except Snape's private library had been transferred to the restricted section after his death, and that man knew a few things about blood and potions. Then she worked up a methodology to match blood, a concept common in muggle detective shows, but shockingly neglected in the wizarding world. Now the recipe for the blood potion was developed, at least in theory, and Hermione was anxious to begin. But she didn't know how she could without Malfoy, and they still weren't speaking. This potion was more complex than Fiducia, and she wasn't sure she could brew it successfully even with Malfoy's help. The Slytherin had returned to his former reserve, looking a bit like he had in sixth year, his eyes ringed with shadows. He spoke to Hermione in patience only when necessary, and waved away Ron's baiting comments. Hermione began to fret. What if he ignored her ultimatum? What if he didn't feel the need to regain her trust after all? Had she misjudged him entirely? How could she ever trust a Malfoy whose very name meant bad faith? Malfoy was her only option, though. Nobody else was adept enough. Hermione seriously considered burying Snape's portrait from McGonagall's office and propping it on a shelf in the potions lab. She was that desperate. Hermione was sitting in her beanbag in Dada, trying to think of a way to blackmail Slughorn into helping her when Bluebell's wind chime signaled the end of class. A huge relief. The session had focused on the language of flowers as part of the Dada professor's Love is the Answer thesis. Hermione continued to resent Bluebell's teaching style. Without a textbook or syllabus, there was no way to prepare which meant she'd spent the entire class watching Neville wipe the floor with her in recitations as Bluebell transformed a quill into various flowers and everyone noted their meanings. Theo was surprisingly good at the lesson as well, and Malfoy's absence meant a peaceful, if academically barren, afternoon. Hermione thought about sending Bluebell a basket of dark purple anemones to represent her fading hope that this class would ever help her with her nukes. Have an apple blossom day, Bluebell called as they left. Hermione grunted in annoyance. I am a swan floating over the pond. I am at peace. Hermione? What the fuck? she shouted. Then she focused. She was standing by the potions dungeon with no idea how she got there. And Theo was looking at her quizzically. Hermione, are you all right? He touched her right wrist, and she could feel his smooth, cold fingers on hers. What are you doing here? My special potions project... She said, yanking her hand back nervously. It was somewhat true. She needed to cross-reference the ingredients needed for a blood potion with the dungeon stores. Really? Can I help? His eager expression gave Hermione a pang of guilt. They hadn't yet set a date to go to Hogsmeade. She'd been so distracted. Thank you, Theo, but I don't think you're ready for this kind of potion, she said. Merlin, Hermione, you know how to build up a man, she grinned. Oh, Theo, she said, fluttering her eyelashes, could you help me with my little potion? I'm trying to make it pink and bubbly, but it's still just a bit too orange. And, oh dear, I've dropped my guardy roots. Let me just pick them up. Theo raised an eyebrow. Let me get this straight. I had to watch Draco practically licking his plate at dinner last week, but you object to a little harmless... Hermione, another voice interrupted. She looked away from Theo, exacerbated to see Ernie McMilling standing before them. The head boy was taller now, but still all earnestness and big ears. Hello, Ernie, she said. The Hufflepuff had been trying to get her to join the seventh and eighth year social committee, but she'd sworn off student government this year. I told you I can't help you plan the Halloween feast. It's not that, 
Although we could really use you, Ernie said. We are trying to brainstorm ways to incorporate into house unity into the proceedings and so far. What are you after then, Macmillan? The cut intensity. I've just come from the hatmistress's office, Ernie said. They are waiting for you, Hermione. Who? Oh, it's from the Ministry of Magic, Ernie said. They're arresting Draco Malfoy. To be continued. Thank you for listening to The Gloriana Set by Theba Moon, read by Ella Max Mabella. If you would like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on AO3, YouTube or Spotify.